Filipino giving me suits, gangster suits. Come on, somebody. Let's talk about it, respectfully. Fox News. Now, a lot, of, a lot of people do not like Fox News regardless. Fox 5, Fox News, anything related to Fox. Right? So as we, you know, be aware of this foxhole, this is the second show they're promoting Puffy's former bodyguard, Sean Combs' former bodyguard, Gene Dill. Gene Dill's statement on Florida Dialogue that Puffy was a confidential informant for the FBI. Now, certain things in life you cannot hide, especially in a time like this. So it will come out. If Fox News already said they cannot prove that Puff was a confidential informant, Fox out of all people. Diddy's former bodyguard tonight, alleging that Diddy was working for the FBI as a confidential informant. People don't realize this, brother. First and foremost, Puff has been dodging the legal system for years. Puff being, um, and this is documented, Puff being a CI for an FBI agent. They was taking some papers up to the, to the uh, uh, FBI, still like when they was here in New York. They was taking paperwork up there and stuff like that. Don't know what it was. But later on, found out that he was a CI. Now, Primetime can't confirm this, but if Diddy was an FBI informant, it explains why he was giving a pass to wreak havoc. Come on, somebody. I'm talking to somebody. Now, if Primetime and Fox, y'all cannot prove that Puff was a confidential informant, y'all got to stop with this old head with the clout chaser narrative. With the cap and narrative, you're gonna fuck the whole shit up for y'all. Cause we're gonna hold y'all accountable, Fox. Let's dig a little deeper to the Tupac Nation. It will come out if Puff was a confidential informant. That's New York. I'm from New York. Shout out to the West Coast. It's the best coast. Prove me wrong. <laughs> Respectfully. Willie Boy Johnson. When y'all got time. Check out who's Wilfred Johnson. John Gotti, his bro, one of his hitmen's, one of his goons. When the feds was trying to hold Gotti on a larger case, on a RICO case, they couldn't get it, but there was a prosecutor in New York, a female, she had a lighter case, which was an assault case, and they were trying to stick Gotti with that. During that trial, the assault trial, it was found out, Gotti found out that the man sitting right next to him was to was revealed as a confidential informant for the feds. He ain't lived that longer after that either. <laughs> if you know what I mean, bada boom, bada bang. You understand? So it will come out if Puff was a confidential informant if this goes to trial. So this bodyguard and Fox, we're gonna hold y'all accountable as we always do. Because we already showed y'all that he lied. Puff, former bodyguard, Gene Dill, cleared Puffy in front of Ben Crump. So you've heard these uh, allegations by Keefe D that Puff gave a million dollars to Zip, and Zip was supposed to give it to Keefe D to kill Suge and Tupac. Yeah, which is bull****. First of all, Puff wouldn't give Zip a dime. Mm. You understand? Because he know if you give Zip anything, it's Zips. Mm. So he wouldn't have gave Zip a dime. Yeah, at some point, do you reach out again for Zip, or how do you uh, how do you try to get paid? I kept calling his ass. Was he avoiding you? Yeah. It's bull****. I heard all of it. Puff was a businessman. You know what I'm saying? And his business had nothing to do with putting people out there to be murdered putting out there, people be hurt. He said, I got 127 employees. They depend on me for their living. He said, if those white folks thought I did any kind of gunplay or anything, they not gonna, they not gonna spend no money with me. Wow. You understand? He said, I'm here to make money and help people take care of their family. He even stopped big 
that song came up, hit him up. Big, Big said the statement, next somebody know my name, I'm gonna get at him. Puff even stopped that. So do you think Keefe D is full of it? You gotta understand. His life depending on what he tell these dudes to get his freedom. So you think it was not true? No, it wasn't true. Not at all, man. Not at all, man. Okay. He has said that these allegations are false, but they get drunk with power, and all of a sudden they lose their, their balance and what's right and what's wrong. And they're insulated, and they've got everybody telling them they're great. And all of a sudden, these civil suits come out. And the feds watch this. That's what happened with R. Kelly. It started with civil suits. Then HSI got involved, and, and they're the lead agency for human yeah, trafficking. Yeah, these civil suits are just like a silver platter for the feds very helpful, to very helpful. take these guys down. All right, well, we'll see how this plays out. Chris Hansen, take down with Chris Hansen. And so now we have two people come out saying that that he was talking to the feds. Do you think that's true? Whether it's true or not, and he might have been cooperative in some way, shape, or form, you don't get away with human trafficking unless you give up John Gotti or something like that, and that's not what happened here. I can tell you, Jesse, this, that this investigation's been going on for a long time, very closely held by HSI, so much so that even some of the agents on the raid a week ago today, didn't know whose house they were raiding until they got there. That's how closely held this wow, investigation. Wow, because there could have been a tip. Absolutely. And there are allegations that he was paying law enforcement through his chief of security, which also happened to be Michael Jackson's chief of security. I don't know if I buy into that. You know, people in Diddy's situation like to have those involved in law enforcement close to them. But that doesn't mean they're taking payoffs. That doesn't mean they're doing big favors. They like that closeness. It's just like how Diddy was able to court Diageo or Estee Lauder. He was very successful in doing that and that made him a lot of money and gave him credibility outside the hip hop rap world. And that's what he was trying to do here. A lot like what Epstein did with very powerful political and business. Figures. And if you look at this report in the New York Post, you see it's a constellation oh, of billionaires he's involved Very with. similar to what Epstein was doing. And, you know, these guys get drunk with power, allegedly. You know, Diddy has said that these allegations are false, but they get drunk with power and all of a sudden they lose their, their balance and what's right and what's wrong. And they're insulated and they've got everybody telling them they're great. And all of a sudden, these civil suits come out. And the feds watch this. That's what happened with R. Kelly. It started with civil suits. Then HSI got involved. And, and they're the lead agency for human Yeah, it's, these civil suits are just like a silver platter for the feds very helpful, to very helpful. take these guys down. All right, well, we'll see how this plays out. Chris Hansen, take down with Chris Hansen. It was a stunning scene. Two mansions belonging to Sean Diddy Combs were simultaneously raided by Homeland Security. Federal investigators raiding two homes owned by hip-hop mogul Sean Diddy Combs. Sources telling ABC News it is connected to a human trafficking investigation. Now what we're learning about the raids being led by prosecutors with the Southern District of New York. Two of Combs' sons were briefly detained as authorities searched through Diddy's L.A. residence. The aftermath of the raid seen in footage from TMZ. Federal investigators seizing a number of electronic devices from the hip-hop and liquor moguls' homes so far, no criminal charges have been filed. Combs seen over Easter weekend out and about on the deck of his Miami mansion that was raided. In a statement provided to ABC News, Combs attorney Aaron Dyer said there was a gross overuse of military level force as search warrants were executed, and that this is nothing more than a witch hunt based on meritless accusations made in civil lawsuits, adding that Mr. Combs is innocent and will continue to fight every single day to clear his name. In a separate civil lawsuit, amended just two days after the raid, Bob by Rodney Jones Jr., a producer, videographer, and former employee of Combs. Lil Rod, you know, he is a music producer. He's originally from Chicago, Illinois, and he was someone who was recruited to come and work on Diddy's most recent album. The scathing lawsuit filed against Combs in New York's Southern District. We don't know for sure if Rodney Jones's lawsuit started off the criminal investigation, but a lot of what he said in his lawsuit seems to be investigated by the Southern District of New York. The lawsuit alleges Combs engaged in serious illegal activity, 
including the acquisition, use, and distribution of ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and mushrooms, the displaying and distribution of unregistered illegal firearms, and providing laced alcoholic beverages to minors and sex workers. This suit, just one of several filed since last December, Combs has denied all allegations of wrongdoing. The first of those five civil suits, a bombshell filing by Combs' former girlfriend, singer Cassie Ventura, alleged a decade-long pattern of physical, verbal, and sexual abuse, describing her experience with so-called freak-offs, where she alleges she was forced to have sex with men in front of Combs for his pleasure. Combs settled the suit with Cassie just 24 hours after its filing for an undisclosed amount of money, Combs saying in a statement through his attorney, Mr. Combs' decision to settle the lawsuit does not in any way undermine his flat-out denial of the claims. He is happy they got to a mutual settlement, and wishes Miss Ventura the best. Cassie's friend and songwriter Tiffany Redd speaking out in an interview with NBC News. She told me the only time he was willing to do anything or work on her music, go through any um, plans, any of that, was when she had a freak off. If he's found liable or he settles, he's facing a large dollar amount at the end of the day. The issue, though, is within a lot of those civil cases, are criminal allegations. And as we've seen, or what it appears to have happened, is that the SDNY is looking at those civil charges and pursuing them criminally. This is a huge deal for, for Diddy. I think if any of these allegations are proved to be true, it crumbles an empire that so many people used as a blueprint of success. The rapper has flaunted a larger-than-life bad boy persona since his beginnings as a hip-hop producer in the early 90s. Name it, I could claim it, young, black, and famous. And in hits, like Can't Nobody Hold Me Down. I call all the shots, rip all the spots, rock all the rocks. And Mo Money, Mo Problems. Diddy founding Bad Boy Records in 1993, launching the careers of rapper Mace, and most famously, Biggie Smalls, the notorious B.I.G. And if you don't know, now you know. P. Diddy is a music mogul, but to be honest with you, he's far bigger than that. You know, he not only helped to really push out the culture of hip hop and the hip hop generation, but in a lot of ways, he really kind of created the, the culture. It's almost impossible to say what hand Diddy does not have in, in a business because it's, it's truly in a lot of places. In the late 90s and early 2000s, Diddy starting multiple lucrative business ventures, including a fashion and lifestyle brand, Sean John. You are what you say you are. I am king. A promotional deal for Ciroc Vodka and building a reality empire. So here we are now, making the band three. The mogul, most notably starring in and executive producing MTV's Making the Band. Diddy, also known in celebrity circles for throwing lavish parties. Diddy has always been known for over-the-top parties. And you'd be hard-pressed probably to find someone of note who hasn't been to a Diddy party of some sort in the last 20 years. There have always been rumors that Sean Combs' parties have been very crazy and somewhat wild. But now the allegations seem to give life to the idea that it was more than just a crazy and wild time. Grammy-winning singer Usher spoke of his time living with Combs when he was 13 on Howard Stern's Sirius XM radio show. It was curious. I got a chance to see some things. Yeah, but you were 13. What were you I seeing? I went there to see the lifestyle. Right. And, and I saw it. And it was, and it was <laughs> but I don't know if I could indulge and understand what I was even looking at. That lifestyle, now at the center of Rodney Jones Jr.'s 98-page lawsuit. Rodney Jones claims that he was sexually abused by Sean Combs multiple times that his anus and genitalia were touched on multiple occasions in different areas. According to the lawsuit, all employees, from the butler to the chef to the housekeepers, would walk around with a black Prada pouch or fanny pack filled with drugs of all kinds. Jones says he witnessed illegal sexual activity too. Jones accuses Sean Combs of recruiting people to go and get sex workers and minors to participate in sex in various parties and all over the country with Sean Combs and others. Jones alleges that he was drugged and or forced to have sex with sex workers. On another occasion, there was an event where in addition to sex workers, there were at least five girls under the age of 16. All of them were forced to drink De Leon liquor, which was laced with ecstasy. The lawsuit, outlining a bloody crime too. Jones alleges Combs, or his son, shot someone in the stomach in a bathroom at a recording studio. 
and then later lied to police claiming a drive-by shooting was to blame. The LAPD investigated the shooting and Combs was not charged. Jones says he was terrified of Combs and felt like he could not tell him no. Also in the lawsuit, Jones alleges Combs even threatened to eat his face. Jones claims he wasn't paid what he was owed for his work on Combs' album and is now seeking $30 million in damages. There is a potential that Sean Combs' attorneys argue that this is buyer's remorse, that he in fact wanted to do all of these acts, but because he wasn't paid in the amount that he wants, he's now bringing up these allegations. That could hurt his credibility. Combs' attorney responding to the civil lawsuit saying, Mr. Jones is shamelessly looking for an easy and a wholly undeserved payday. We have indisputable, incontrovertible proof that his claims are complete fabrications. I don't know if Diddy survives this. I think so much of that remains to be seen. And the court of public opinion, you know, in a lot of ways carries more weight than the actual court of law does. So I'm not sure if he can really repair what's already been done himself to the ultra rich as he turned his edgy rap glamour into a billion dollar fortune. In our reporting, we learned he is a serious hustler who used his celebrity to attract big names on Wall Street and either do deals with them or befriend them. And that lended him credibility as a businessman. Here are three of the boldest moves he made. In 2003, he sent then owner of the Dallas Mavericks, Mark Cuban, an email asking to design the uniforms for the NBA team. They'd never met, so it was a pretty bold move. For Diddy, it was a slam dunk to associate his new clothing brand, Sean John, with a pro sports team, and he leveraged it for even more deal making. And it was a two-way street. Diddy also used his own cachet, the promise of entry into a world of celebrity, to attract investment for his projects. That same year, Diddy got Ron Burkle, a billionaire investor, to inject 100 million into that same line, Sean John. His second bold move? In 2007, he was approached by the alcohol giant Diageo to become a spokesperson for its Ciroc vodka. But he countered by proposing that he should become brand manager and chief marketing officer in return for a 50% profit share. He even had the business cards made up for his new role before the deal was done. The vodka brand agreed, and he didn't miss an opportunity to promote it. It ultimately netted him a billion dollars over the next 15 years. Diddy was one of the first celebrities to license his name to brands, and companies were able to draw on and reach a more diverse group of customers as a result. His third aggressive move, Diddy forged a relationship with Ray Dalio, who as well as being a founding member of Bridgewater, the world's largest hedge fund, is also worth about $15.4 billion, and has become a sought after guru for his principles of radical transparency. Dalio tweeted in 2019 that Diddy asked me to mentor him and posted a slickly produced video of a recent mentor session of ours. Now, after being accused of sex trafficking, domestic violence and rape, brands, of course, are distancing themselves. And it appears that his long lasting business empire could be in serious. Trouble. As new details surface into the investigation into two of Diddy's homes, Fox 5 is getting an up close look at the sex trafficking case against another high profile hip hop artist. All right, Fox 5's Lisa Everett spoke with former federal prosecutor who helped send R. Kelly to jail. She joins us now with more on what goes into a case like this, Lisa. Well, Steve and Natasha, there are signs today the investigation involving Sean Diddy Combs may be further along than we thought. A former top federal prosecutor says he may be looking at a RICO sex trafficking case. This comes as Diddy breaks his social media silence, but makes no reference to the legal issues on the horizon. Sean Diddy Combs posted beautiful photos of his youngest daughter on his Instagram with the caption, Happy Easter from Baby Love. The adorable images are a sharp contrast with the investigation he's facing, one so intense it prompted raids on March 25th on his Miami and Los Angeles homes. They have now conducted two public search warrants of two homes. That's a significant step in any investigation. It means they have probable cause to believe a crime has been committed and that 
they'll find evidence of that crime in those locations. Combs has categorically denied any wrongdoing in five civil lawsuits, as well as the sex trafficking case. But the home raids signaled a critical turning point. It became clear a major federal investigation was underway, says former federal prosecutor Nadia Shahada, who successfully prosecuted R. Kelly in the RICO sex trafficking case that put the R&B singer behind bars for more than 30 years. It suggests to me that the investigation is well underway. Um, you need more than just kind of allegations to convince two different federal judges that you have enough for a search warrant. And so that suggests to me that they've probably spoken to multiple people. Amid the social media frenzy surrounding the Diddy investigation are unproved allegations going back decades. Shahada says the typical statute of limitations for adult sex trafficking is 10 years, but a RICO charge would change that. Each of these uh, crimes can also be charged as predicate acts under RICO, the racketeering statute, which would significantly expand the statute of limitations applicable and you could go back decades. The next step is for prosecutors to present the case to a grand jury which could decide to indict Combs and others or dismiss the case. I suspect that they may have already started presenting evidence to a grand jury or potentially putting witnesses before a grand jury. Now, we reached out to the U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, which is coordinating the investigation, and they declined to comment. We also reached out to Combs attorney, Aaron Dyer, who has vigorously denied the charges in the past, but did not get a response. On Steve? the screen, we brought everybody the news about how the feds had raided two of P. Diddy's residences, both in Los Angeles and in Miami, allegedly over a sex trafficking investigation. It appears now from the New York Post, who definitely would have the scoop on something like mm -hmm. this, they say the feds are set to widen the Diddy sex probe over claims that the rapper boasted about shooting people, bribing jurors, and using J-Lo as a gun mule. It says, quote, 25 years ago, at 2.30 a.m. on a cold winter night, three NYPD detectives were called into Midtown North Precinct. Rap impresario Sean Combs, then known as Puff Daddy, with his girlfriend Jennifer Lopez, and his bodyguard, as well as another rapper, had been arrested following a shooting inside of a Times Square club that had wounded three bystanders. The cops then found J-Lo at that time, quote, cuffed in the cage. Combs was in the station house, and his plans for a spectacular celebration of the new millennium. Man, this is really dated. <laughs> uh, for a few days later, we're temporarily on hold. It says, now the events of that night and the sensational trial which followed are back in the spotlight. Two law enforcement sources are telling the Post that the infamous shooting and the trial would be reinvestigated as part of the sweeping probe into Sean Combs and specifically around the gun mule accusations as well as an alleged cover-up and bribing jurors and eventually got him off of one of the gun charges that we had listed and discussed here previously. Part of the reason that they swarmed and went into both of his residences, it appears, is into the sex trafficking investigation for which they were appearing to look for evidence. Obviously, transporting a minor across state lines for the purposes of sex is a federal crime of which there is a very, very lengthy jail sentence. And that's exactly what Mr. Combs is actually being accused of and was previously in some of these lawsuits. But it does appear, I mean, this is a serious, serious problem for him. This is up there with R. Kelly and others. I do know, Chris, there's been a lot of uh, conspiracy that this is like about covering covering up some of the people that he was involved with. And it, it will be interesting to see, are they going to tug on some of the threads here that include uh, J-Lo or many of the other rappers and other famous people who are in his orbit? Or are they going to do what they did with Epstein, which is focus on two charges from 20, 30 years ago or whatever mm -hmm. that don't implicate anybody? Mm -hmm. Throw Ghislaine in jail. Just be like, yeah, we're just going to forget that the entire mm -hmm. thing happened. Yeah, That's going to be a big question. And the main character turns up dead. Yeah. So. Um, the Epstein vibes here are <clears throat> yeah, off, off the, the charts. charts. Yeah, I agree. Because you have um, Diddy at the center of this entire ring of celebrities. I mean, he hosted these infamous white parties in the Hamptons. He had not just his, you know, the it was not just the music industry. It was the fashion industry. He's this cultural figure with his hands in a lot of different pots. And so a lot of people catching strays right now with regards to the Diddy allegations. A lot of rumors flying about who knew what when. Because the allegations against Diddy, I mean, they last decades. They are extensive. There is a consistent pattern that they appear to reveal. Um, you know, there's a lot of just direct violence 
there's a lot of uh, psychological torture and manipulation. And then there's the allegations of sexual assault and, uh, you know, across state lines, which leads it into sex trafficking. Diddy, of course, denies all of this. But if you were besties with Diddy, didn't you probably know? A hundred percent. Some of these things that were going on, were you potentially involved in some of these things that were going on? And so that's why there's so much uh, uh, sort of connective tissue between him and Epstein because of these elite circles that they were uh, living in, potential dirt that they have on other people who inhabited those circles. And so, yeah, are we gonna learn how deep this went, how far it went beyond Diddy? Who was enabling? You don't can't do the things that he's accused of, you cannot do on your own without other people knowing and being involved. So who was the Ghislaine Maxwell? Who were the other wealthy celebrities who kept their mouths shut because they knew what you had on them? Those are the questions that make this story, you know, significant beyond this one man's apparent, you know, horrific depravity and, you know, cruelty, et cetera. That's what makes this incredibly significant. And it just, it really is wild to see the way that, especially in the entertainment industry, it seems like you come across these characters in every, every sphere because you have these power dynamics where so many people are desperate to get close to fame, close to money, get close to power, that they keep quiet, they enable the behavior, they watch the way they potentially participate in the behavior, and that he was able to keep this under wraps for decades is astonishing. And you know, credit to Cassie, who was the first to file a lawsuit. Right. That really was the watershed moment that lead led to a lot of these revelations, and very likely, you know, ultimately led to this criminal investigation. So again, he denies all the claims and the charges, the allegations. But we will see where this goes. Yeah, I mean, and this is exactly you made a just good point here about you can't participate or pull something like this off without a ton of infrastructure that is underneath you. I mean, part of the thing that really came out about how it was so disgusting about Harvey mm. Weinstein. It's not just Harvey Weinstein. It was all of his assistants and all these other people, his brother, all and these And all the people in Hollywood who were like, yeah, we knew. Right. Yeah. It was an open secret. It's like, what? Like, how, how is this allowed to, you know, just continue happening over and over again? It's like, we need to know the names of a lot of those individuals, and particularly here. I mean, again, as I understand it, the, uh, this is— this story is popping off in pop culture in a way that I don't really think the mainstream media has grappled with just yet. Uh, the views, the level of interest is up there with Epstein, if not actually surpassing it, at least in some places. And if they participate in yet another cover-up in just a matter of years, people are really, really going to take notice of something like that and really learn how this so-called justice system and all mm. of that really works uh, whenever rich, powerful people are implicated in major sex trafficking investigations. Mm. So there we go. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber. Again, Diddy was spotted having that dance party for one at the same Miami estate raided by the feds just five days earlier. The father of seven also broke his silence on social media, posting these photos of his 17-month-old daughter with the caption, quote, Happy Easter from baby love. Diddy's 26-year-old son, Christian, who was handcuffed and questioned during the L.A. raid, also posted for the first time. He says, quote, stop with the caps, which is slang for lies. Bad boy. There's a whole public relations side of this. Diddy is going to want to put up a front of an innocent person. And sometimes the best defense is a good offense. Right now, investigators are going through the evidence that they seize. What they're really looking for are videos of the alleged sexual abuse. If prosecutors have that information, we're talking about days or weeks before Diddy is charged. He may go to prison for the rest of his life. Take it like I'm, it's, a, it's a championship fight and I'm ready to go. Of course, Diddy's lawyer called the raid and allegations a witch hunt, but the Department of Homeland Security maintains they believe that there is a disturbing history of sex trafficking and are responding to concrete, detailed, explicit allegations. A surprising person weighing in on the Diddy investigation? Longtime hip hop rival and incarcerated Death Row Records co-founder, Suge Knight, he offered some ominous advice from his prison podcast, Collect Call with Suge Knight, where he is serving a 28-year sentence for voluntary manslaughter. I tell you what, Puffy, your life is in danger because you know the secrets, so you know they're going to get you if they can. Diddy's longtime friend Nick Cannon has also entered the chat. He shared on his 
Council Culture podcast, he feels divided. I don't know how to feel about that. But as a friend and as a brother, I'm, I want to defend. Sometimes you say, I'm going to reserve comment. 